and welcome back to the all new all different number one comics podcast we're doing we read a comic uh we got getting and me dan on the line getting what's up how are you been a, a few minutes since we last talked uh how's everything going over there uh things are good you know it's uh I forget where you are, but I'm in California, and lately it's uh, the weather has been a bit wild. <laughs> um, just a couple of days ago, like the winds were so like baleful outside that um, I leave my shoes outside on my on my outside my door. I had to, like I had to bring them in just because I was worried they'd blow away. <laughs> you were having to chase your shoes down the street barefoot. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds terrible. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm in the land of like wacky weather too. I'm in Florida, so like we're on opposite ends of the country. But uh, yeah, I mean it's usually not like anything too crazy over here. It's just I'm sure you can relate. You know the kind of I don't know what you call it subtropical climate or whatever. It's super hot all the time, and then every now and again it gets like a little too cold that you're not prepared for, and then it rains you know unexpectedly every ten minutes or so. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying lately it's been very eccentric, you know? <laughs> <laughs> a little crazy over there. Well, I think that that's cool, and that kind of fits the theme of <laughs> what we're talking about today anyway. So that's that's like a good way to open the show, of course. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you suggested that we talk about the new Dark Horse book, Helen of Windhorn. And Helen of Windhorn is... A new book by Tom King, uh, Tom King scripting, and then, uh, like, I'll completely butcher the artist's name, so if you know how to pronounce it, feel free to step in. Uh, I think, <laughs> and I could very well be wrong, but I think it's supposed to be Bill Quees. Okay. Bill Quees, uh, Evely or something, yeah, something along those lines. Uh, a name that I should know, you know, uh, of course, <laughs> Bill Quees uh, worked on... Uh, you know, Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, uh, along Great with Tom book. King and the rest of the entire rest of this creative team. So that's like another cool thing about this book. This book has a lot of cool stuff going on for it or, or about it or whatever. But, you know, one of the things that stands out, and I think one of the things that drew a lot of people to the book before they even like read any solicit or knew anything about the book was the creative team. Uh, you have, yeah. you know, Tom King writing. Tom King's a great writer of course. And I mean, I'm pretty much going to pick up anything that Tom King writes. Uh, I don't know if you read Animal Pound that came out. I think it was probably about three months ago at this point. I read um, the first issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. like you, I'm a, I'm a big King head. Uh, <laughs> I, I try to, yeah. I mean, I, I try to read everything he does. Um, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm behind on some of his books, but you know, eventually I get to them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. But he's, he's a great writer, you know, comes up with some great, you know, ideas, some, some cool, fantastical stories and stuff like that. The art in this, you know, by Bill Quees is outrageous. And we'll get into that whenever we talk more about the book, but again, like sticking with that same creative team from Supergirl woman of tomorrow, such like a highly acclaimed book, you know, everybody loves that book and everything. And ironically enough, it's, it's what they're going to go to, you know, to script out a movie and everything. They're going to use that story. So that book has been, you know, kind of in the comic book headlines recently and all of that as well. So I don't think, you know, everything, this book has like everything going for it right now. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it's I'm, a really... I'm surprised by how much yeah. <laughs> it reminded me of, of that Supergirl series. Right? I mean, yeah. Beyond it, the creative team, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really does. And I listened to an interview with Tom King and there's not like, I mean, Tom King has done interviews, of course, but, you know, there's not like a whole lot out there on like podcasts and I'm listening to or anything where Tom King's hopping on or anything like that. But he did like this little uh, podcast interview with somebody who has like a smaller YouTube channel and was talking about the book and, and all of that and gave some really cool insight. I wish I had it like handy to reference it. Um, I'll definitely send you a link later if you want to check it out. But uh, it, it was basically him, you know, telling the story of, of how this came together and everything and how he was like, he was like, look, I'll go ahead and lay it out on Front Street here. If you were into Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, you're going to be into this book. Like it kind of picks up where that left off in a way, you know, it's a very different book, of course, but, you know, the storytelling and all that and, and just kind of does the same thing. So 
I was like, wow, that's that's really cool. And then, you know, to listen to the author, you know, kind of break it down, they're like, they're like, look, there's not, you know, you think there's all this magic and everything behind it. He's like, we have these people, you know, these these four people basically in a room together, like who created magic before. We're just going to do it again. Like, no, no problem. Uh, pre- pretty crazy, but really cool. Um, I'm, I'm really digging it. I definitely want to talk about the book. Uh, I, I don't know, like, you know, usually I read a synopsis or something like that from, um, you know, somewhere online. And I think that that might be a smart thing to do because just trying to go into this book cold, like, might be a little hard for some people. I think the synopsis is a little long, so I'll try to, yeah, it, it, it's a little longer than most, uh, um, I, I don't know, uh, synopsis from publishers out there, but I'll, I'll go ahead and try to go over it really quick. Uh, from Eisner Award winning and best-selling creative team of Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow comes this gothic sword and sorcery epic that's Conan the Barbarian meets the Wizard of Oz. Following the tragic death of her late father, C.K. Cole, the esteemed pulp writer and creator of popular warrior, warrior sorry, character Othan, Helen Cole is called back to her grandfather's enormous and illustrious estate, the Windhorn House. Scarred by Cole's untimely passing and lost in a new strange world, Helen wreaks drunken havoc upon her arrival. However, her chaotic ways begin to soften as she discovers a lifetime of secrets hiding within the myriad of rooms and hallways of the expansive manor. For outside its walls, within the woods, dwell the legendary adventures that once were locked away within her father's stories. So yeah, that's a that's actually a really good synopsis. I I, I didn't read it beforehand. I don't know if you did. Like, did you or how familiar uh, were, you, were you with yeah, this? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know when you know when a new book is in the headlines. You know, and and when a new book is announced, and you're excited about it, you know, I'm sure at some point, like I, I scan, <laughs> I scan that synopsis just because I was, I would be too eager to stop myself. Yep. <laughs> uh, the, the funny thing is, though, he said it was um, what Conan the Barbarian meets the Wizard of Oz. Is that what he said? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The funny thing is, like, there was another place where it was described as, I think, um, I think it was a, uh, either it was Wuthering Heights meets Conan. <laughs> Or yeah, I think that was it. Wuthering Heights meets Conan. So, and as some people pointed out, you know, it's interesting seeing both of those because then you're trying to triangulate, like, <laughs> how does something exist in all three spaces? Right. Like maybe maybe they're trying to bring the the gothic sensibilities of Wuthering Heights or something. Uh, yeah, I I like that though. I didn't really, <laughs> I haven't thought about that. And and again, I haven't really read the synopsis or anything. Very very interesting. Uh, really cool elements to to bring into to the story and everything i think if i were to have to i don't know write a synopsis for it or something i would throw in like something like the notebook in there too <laughs> i don't know if you're familiar with that nicholas spark story the notebook that they made a, a movie. I, i've seen the film mm-hmm. um yeah, yeah. i'm not sure i I'm, I'm seeing the connection you're seeing but... <laughs> right no it's like the or, or or like titanic or something you know kind of having like the the older character, uh, you know, telling the story, like narrating the story. So, so something like that. All oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean now. Yeah, yeah, that's the only connection. But <laughs> yeah, not saying there's anything, you know, any story elements or anything. But uh, yeah, no, that that would make the notebook like a lot cooler if it was something like this. <laughs> I, I can dig so that. So I'm curious, like, when you like, do you ever go into a book cold, uh, or do you always like try to find out a little bit about it before you re- start reading it? I. In all honesty, I typically try to go in cold um, uh-huh. for the most part. And then after I've read it, I like to read synopsises, reviews, all of that stuff. Uh, it's it's a little hard sometimes, like you said, every now and again, you get really jazzed about something and then you start reading things uh, and, and looking up interviews and all that. But I always, I, I, I try my best to go in completely cold, form like my own opinion and then read other stuff because it, it, it's really interesting. Um, I really love some of the stuff that that I find out there. Uh, there's there's a lot of you know obviously really biased people and stuff on the internet. Surprise, but uh, you know a lot of times like I'll really love something and then I'll see the general consensus for it is like ah it's horrible you know it's a piece of shit and I'm like wow I just love everything I guess but um <laughs> it's, yeah that, that happens sometimes to me too and like you're when that happens you wonder like you know is all these people who hate it, you know, it's like how much of that is genuine 
and yeah. how much of that is like jumping onto the bandwagon you know the bandwagon you know because i also don't hate it like how can i like this so much and how like how can my reaction be like so utterly different from all these people you know yeah i i completely agree i can't i'm trying to remember exactly what it was and again i don't, I don't have anything in front of me but uh i interviewed steve orlando like a maybe like two months ago or something like that and steve had a book coming out it, it was it was uh spider-man 29 miguel o'hare spider-man 299 or something um but but anyways uh i had just you know done like a deep dive on steve orlando stuff so i was i was like knee deep in steve orlando i was reading all all kind of stuff and there was one particular book and uh oh god what was it um i don't know it, it, it was probably scarlet witch or something um yes i think it was actually and you know i love that book i absolutely love his his run on scarlet which is so good and uh there's I, I don't know you know just looking at reviews and stuff you know i, I think they're kind of mixed uh, a lot of people like it some people don't whatever but um i happened to, across this this one youtube channel and this podcast and this guy was talking about how horrible it was worst thing ever you know blah 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 and all this stuff and then i get down to it and i'm like oh it's it's his political agenda that's what the problem is you know this guy uh you know reviewing this comic and everything is uh, a bigot you know he doesn't like anybody in, in any of those communities or anything he's like a very conservative guy and all that stuff and uh I'm like, oh, okay. Like, you're just, you're just a bigot. Like, there's not any problem with Steve Orlando's writing. He's actually an amazing writer. But your problem is your, you know, politics or whatever. So, um, yeah, I always find that kind of thing interesting. A lot of people uh, do that, you know. And um, of course, you know, we all have, uh, you know, our own thoughts and views on things, and, and there's no problem with that. Uh, it's, I, you know, as long as you're not going to be hateful about it. But, um, but it's interesting sometimes to, like you said, how can I love this thing so much? And then, you know, somebody else like right over here is like shits on it or the general consensus is that it's bad or whatever. And it's, I find a lot of times it has to do with like personal beliefs like that. It's not, it's not that something's like uh, poorly written or anything. It's, it's, it's somebody's like specific beliefs or something a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we all bring baggage to, mm -hmm. to what we read. I mean, there's that saying by, um, I forget who said it, but um, it's, it's all criticism is autobiography. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's always it's always a reflection of our own priorities. You know, so like right? what matters to us, what interests us. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll jump off of this topic really quick, but uh, you know, just another one that's not as divisive. Uh, uh, Bob and I on the podcast, uh, you know, the last episode, we did the new uh, Marvel book, Ghost Rider: Final Vengeance. I don't know if you read that this past week or not. Really cool book. I highly recommend it. But I'm a big Ghost Rider fan, you know. So I'm 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 usually in for you know some Ghost Rider. Like that stuff's always fun. And this book is like really weird. It, like it opens up with um, I can't remember the demon's name now, but uh, the Thoros or something. Um, but he uh, strips uh, Johnny Blaze of of the Spirit of Vengeance. So you know um, he takes it and he's like, uh, you know, the problem here is that Johnny Blaze is using this for good and it was meant for evil. So I got to find an evil host concept you know i i'm totally into that i'm like hell yeah that's some like 90s extreme ghostwriter stuff or whatever and uh so the the really fun thing about this book like one of the things that i absolutely loved was the spirit of vengeance like it's just you know through the panels it's like a 40 page book too so it's a little bit oversized but it just goes through like almost like a third of the book or something it's just the spirit of vengeance in one panel going through like this character and then and there's not enough rage in this one. Let me go to the next one or whatever. And it it starts off like, you know, in a movie theater and there's actually people watching The Wizard of Oz and it goes through all the people in the movie theater. Then it jumps on screen and goes to the characters in The Wizard of Oz. Then it, it jumps to a strip club and goes into a stripper. And then it's like on, on this like surfer and then goes to the shark and stuff. And it's really cool and it's a lot of fun. It's just like a great, fun, fun book. And again, like I went into it super cold and then I looked up some reviews and stuff and people were just like, this is shit this is the dumbest thing ever. You know, I hated it and blah, blah, blah. And how could they ruin this? And I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> Me and Bob loved it. Like <laughs> we had such a great time. That's so weird. But I don't know. I, I guess it also depends, you know, what you're looking for in a comic. Like, are you looking for it to like change your life and say something really profound? Like, are you just looking to have some like dumb fun? Like, are you looking for a good read, something that's written well? Like, I don't know. I, I, I feel like for me at least, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm looking for different things, but I can usually find something 
that I really, really like. And, and my main criteria is that like, is this like well-written? Um, and, you know, a lot of times, like in the case of the book that we're going to cover today, Helen of Windhorn, I get scared when there's like a lot of dialogue in a comic, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, sometimes it's like a turnoff for me. I don't know about you. Um, for uh, me, this one yeah. really worked though, but. <laughs> yeah, for me, it, it all depends on what the dialogue is doing like what is yes. it, what is trying to do what, what is achieving yeah so I, I i know what you mean there are some books where they or you just want the writer to shut up you know because, <laughs> yeah. because they are just filling it with unnecessary blah 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 you know mm -hmm. um but other times it's you know it's very necessary blah 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 <laughs> yeah yeah it, it really is and it, it it's it's really just how they do it you know so um <clears throat> Yeah, with with all that you know being said, let's <laughs> let's yeah, talk let's, about let's this. Talk, yeah, yeah, let's let's get into it. Yeah, I mean we've only spent fifteen minutes, you know, dancing around it, but <laughs> this yeah, that's 15 yeah. Minutes. <laughs> right. Um, this this book is so cool because you know to me, I'm I'm gonna you know pop it open. I'm gonna have it open next to me because trying to recall like every you know little detail of everything that happens here is gonna be a little tricky, but. Uh, you know, it, it definitely, like I said, it kind of opens up with, you know, what happens at the beginning of Titanic, what happens at the beginning of uh, the curious case of Benjamin Button and uh, the notebook and stuff like that. You have like somebody kind of going back and like retelling the story to somebody else, uh, uh, you know, the, their past or whatever. And we have this character and I think her name is Lilith, uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Okay. And she's a... a governess for uh like we said you know the the granddaughter of or, or sorry the daughter of uh, a popular pulp writer um at, another little tidbit uh, sorry I, I have to jump out for like one second because I, I found this really cool tom king was inspired to write this like kind of like the catalyst for the story itself was the real life of the creator of conan the barbarian um, because, and, and I've heard this from like a few people at this point, which is really weird. Uh, the guy came up with the character, was writing the character, everything. Um, just all of a sudden one day, like out of nowhere, you know, maybe I, I would assume had some like undiagnosed mental illness going on or, or some depression or something, but like, you know, just, uh, died by suicide one day, like kind of unexpected and everything. And like his family, you know, and, and, like nobody knew what was going on. Like it was really weird and jarring. So that was almost, that was kind of like the catalyst for the story itself, uh, which I thought was really cool. Um, but yeah, you can definitely see echoes of that. Uh, yeah, for sure. And also Robert Howard, I think he was, you know, he he was a he was a Texan, and isn't this story also set in Texas? Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, there sure is. Yeah, yeah, really cool. Yeah, a lot of parallels to that, and uh, and I, I mean, I, I think probably a love letter too. It doesn't look like they're you know hiding that. So. <laughs> um, Really cool though, but uh, but yeah, we have we have Lilith, you know, starting to retell the story of how she meets Helen and how she, uh, you know, came to be the the governess of, of Helen and basically bring back Helen to her grandfather's estate, uh, the Windhorn House, and Helen's like in bad shape <laughs> when we meet Helen. Uh, I don't know if, if you want to, you know, start there, but yeah, like I, I can, I can leave us off where, you know, uh, where Lilith is, is trying to find Helen because she's, she's like kind of MIA. She's like, where do I find this girl? I've, I've, I've been instructed to bring this girl back to the Windhorn house and I don't even know where she is. And some people tell her like, you know, Hey, go check out this bar or whatever. And she's like, it's like a 16 year old kid. What is she doing at a bar? And, yeah. uh, and, and then where she finds her, if, if you want to take it there, if not, I can take over. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is, I mean, yes, she, you know, she's obviously, the daughter is, all, Helen is obviously in a, in a very bad place. <laughs> yeah. And it, it generally makes me wonder, like, okay, I'm pretty sure, like, even back then, even the 40s, or <laughs> I guess 30s, I guess it's a place in the 30s, mm -hmm. even then, it was illegal to drink alcohol at 16 right <laughs> I, you would think i mean i don't know when those laws like went into effect or anything but yeah i would imagine so <laughs> and, and so yeah i just find it like you know it, but like you know clearly like these people have no problem serving her alcohol <laughs> right and, and i guess the idea is that you know she's like 
she's local like they all know her you know they know she's not gonna like snitch or you know they they <laughs> they just you know they're comfy in their in their life of of you know uh of slightly bending the law mm-hmm. and also i i'd like to point out here too that she's a little pushy you know she's not what you would think of as like a 16 year old girl. I mean, uh, obviously, sorry, let me, let me take that back a, a step. That, not that we should assume, you know, that, any, you know, every, everybody's different and all that, but uh, you know, your stereotypical, like, you know, you're not getting like somebody who's like kind of shy, unsure of themselves or anything. She's like, she knows what she wants. And she's like, no, I, I, I want a shot. I want a pack of cigarettes. Like, you know, she's not shy about any of that. Uh, she knows what she wants and she's pretty pushy about getting it. Yeah, I, I'm. I was kind of surprised at how much leeway the uh, Lilith Lilith gives her because you know oh, yeah. the first couple of panels, like when when we first see Lilith, you know she seems like a very like, you know, very like prim, proper, very like stern figure. You know, mm-hmm. so, like mm-hmm. you would expect a stern sort of governess. But then you know when she meets Helen, she sort of you know she just lets her have her way for the most part. <laughs> yeah, she sure does. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know if it has anything to do with that battle because like they'll get more into that, you know, later on in the book and everything. But again, Helen, like, you know, she's kind of wild. She knows what she wants. And, and like I was saying before, uh, you know, she goes to look for her in the bar and everything anyways, where she finds her is in jail. You know, she's, she's been imprisoned and, uh, and she has to, you know, I, I don't know if that's like, you know, slang for like bailing somebody out back then, but she's paying, you know, uh, various organizations you know in the interest of the police officers to you know get her out or whatever so um yeah so i think that's that's less bail money and more like <laughs> outright bribery right there. okay okay yeah, yeah it makes sense uh, yeah I don't, I don't know how things worked in like the 30s 40s like maybe they didn't i don't know but um but yeah that that makes sense i mean uh, again i think the the point is to illustrate that you know she has these very deep pockets um and she's been outfitted with those deep pockets by the, you know, state of Windhorn and, you know, get the granddaughter back here, you know, by any means necessary and everything like it kind of does that type of thing. So, um, you know, pretty yeah, much right also out- the, um, does it remind you a bit of the opening for a uh, Supergirl woman of tomorrow where, um, yeah. where the, uh, Ruthie, uh, first meets Supergirl mm-hmm. and Supergirl's drunk. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, that that would be like one of the you know like main vibes you're getting here of course you know aside from some of the obvious but yeah uh yeah i i I like that it's really cool and and again it's not hiding the fact that it's uh influenced by certain things and then of course this creative team worked on that book so yeah um i i I like the parallels of that i think it's really cool yeah Um, it's there's a key difference though because mm -hmm. i I think you know when when you see supergirl in that first issue you know she's that's not her normal mode not even no. in that story not <laughs> no. even that story is at her normal mode. she's just having a, a drunk day you know yep. and mm-hmm. um and here i know i think it's safe to say that um that uh, uh helen is having you know a drunk life <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah she definitely is uh and and she's using this to her advantage at this point you know that that little does have those deep pockets and you know, she's even calling it out, like, at the bar and everything. She's like, she's got plenty of dough. Don't worry. You know, bring on the cigarettes, bring on the beers. Um, yeah, I, I, I really like that. I like, it, it's, it's like, not a character trait that I think that I would normally, like, gravitate towards or, like, really like or anything. But she's very likable, even though she's pushy, even though she's, like, this young kid doing bad things and everything. Like, I mean, something about her is just, like, you kind of connect with the character. You're like, okay. <laughs> Um, I'm cool. I don't know. I mean, I was thinking the whole time I read this, like, if I had to deal with this person in like real life, like, mm-hmm. I would be like tearing my hair out. <laughs> <laughs> I would yeah. be absolutely like on my last nerve. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and you can definitely see that, you know, in the next scene because she's Lilith is like going along with it to a certain point, but then some of that sternness like begins to come out because you know they're on the train, they're they're headed back to Windhorn and they're sleeping like she's got like you know first class for them on the train and everything and uh helen's above her in a bunk and she's just like laying up there like talking all night smoking and everything and and lil is like starting at this point to like not really have it she's like hey like this is uh, put out that cigarette you know let's go to bed like whatever and 
Yeah, I think what makes her sympathetic to whatever extent she is here is that you know she clearly has a deep affection for her father. She's defensive mm -hmm. yeah. of him. Of course. And you know, I think that endears us to her that you know that she that she's clearly so uh intent on on defending this person who's recently passed away and who maybe the rest of the world does not look too kindly upon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's there's a lot of that she's um or, or not a lot of it, but you know, there's glimpses of it. And and the stuff that's there is very impactful. Uh you can tell that she had a very special relationship with her father and she holds him in like very hard, high regard. So uh, yeah, um like like you're saying, I mean you put it much better than I could, but um you know, she's she's showing us that uh, that that relationship is like very, very important. And not only the relationship, but like her view of her father, like, you know, the way that she views him and everything and, and how special he was. So, uh, yeah, really, really cool. Um, I you know, this next panel is like a full page spread and it's uh, the exterior of like the Windhorn estate. And it's like, it's it's awesome. This looks really, really cool. This is really, really good. This is really where. I would say, you know, sometimes, a lot of times, whenever I go into like a really, really dialogue, narrative heavy book, like, that's where I get scared. I'm like, ah, they're not letting the art, you know, show the story and all that. This has a perfect balance, though. There's no, uh, you can't take away anything from this art. It doesn't matter how many words are on the page. Um, it's breathtaking. It looks amazing. And, you know, we're already familiar with that, you know, because of the Supergirl book and everything. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think that this panel right here, this full page spread is just really, really top notch. Uh, it's just really cool. And then we're introduced to that Windhorn estate and you're like, holy shit, how many rooms are in this house? Like, what is going on? Yeah, the art, you know, the art and the writing, it's the writing knows when to to pull back, basically. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, and it knows it is, you know, it is wordy. Uh, but it knows when to not do that. It knows the right, the time and place for that. You know? Yep. It, which I would expect out of Tom King, you know, uh, again, being a Tom King fan, um, it's not like you're going to go back and think of very many impactful Tom King stories and say, uh, this one, you know, just had, you know, really just showcased art, you know, did, did the show don't tell type of thing. Uh, no, Tom King's going to tell you what's going on. Like he, but it's not like it's not cheapened or anything. It's not like he's, you know, uh, trying to explain the scenery or, or anything like that or facial expressions or anything like he's letting the art breathe. Absolutely. But like he definitely has a story to tell. Um, so, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just done like in, a, in, in kind of a different way that, you know, not a lot of people are really good at, I guess, is what I want to, you know, what I would want to say about it. <laughs> yeah, he's um, definitely he definitely has like above average talent when it comes to everything yeah. he was talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Really good storyteller. Uh, you know, and, and from there, like, we don't have to go, like, too deep into all this stuff. But, yeah, we, you know, uh, Lilith and uh, and uh, Helen, you know, are introduced to Windhorn and, and let inside. And then uh, Helen is like, all right, I want to see every room in this house. And there's hundreds of them. Uh, there's, you know, definitely over 100 rooms. I can't, I can't remember how many. Uh, 100 and something at least. But... <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, quite a few, 173, sorry, 173 rooms on uh, 1,200 acres of fertile land. So, yeah, really big. And, uh, and you know, through there, we, we go in and out of some of the rooms and, and uh, the butler, the single butler in this in this house right now is, is showing us around. And I think one of the other key points here is that the grandfather, whose, whose name I don't recall, is out like he's out on like some kind of mission he's, he's not here right now so it's basically like a kitchen crew um the governess the butler and helen and and that's all that's happening in these 173 rooms right now um yeah which and, is it's um, crazy <laughs> right and lilith mentions that you know that the butler joseph is a bit of a jackass mm -hmm. but honestly like so far i'm not really seeing it <laughs> i know like i like him like he's he's got a big responsibility here. He seems like he takes his job, like, you know, seriously. Um, but yeah, he doesn't seem like much of a jackass. I'm not getting that either. You know, maybe, maybe something will happen later that'll show us that, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not really seeing that either. So uh, pretty interesting. Um, now, one of the next things that we get to, I think is like, 
you know, it, it's not a big event, but like obviously it's you know something that happens here in the story is uh, uh, Helen is shown like you know the wine cellar area and and basically Joseph explains to her like we have everything from every year you know basically and uh, and Helen picks out a bottle of wine and she smashes it against the wall to break it open and <laughs> starts chugging it and you know passes out somewhere in the mansion so um, uh, this happens and then. Uh, again, another important element of the story, and this is like about the halfway mark of the book, actually exactly the halfway mark here. Uh, Helen, you know, passes out somewhere and then she she gets scared or has a nightmare or whatever. Like, I mean, we know what happened, but, you know, we're not there yet in the story, so we won't say much. But um, uh, she crawls into bed with Lilith, you know, and it's it's almost like Lilith at this point becomes like this motherly figure to uh, to Helen. Like at this point, we're reminded Helen's a sixteen-year-old girl. Uh, she's not, you know, a grown adult woman or anything like that. She she's a kid, and she's scared, and she wants to, you know, hop in bed and kind of like be comforted. Yeah, and I think this scene is, this is the part that endears us to Lilith mm -hmm. because she really has no good reason to care at all about this this you know wild child i mean yes right. yeah, she's being paid to but so mm -hmm. she has no reason to be compassionate towards her because so far you know so far helen has just been a nightmare like all the way through she, like mm -hmm. helen has given her no reason to be kind to her but you know <laughs> but here you know she sees that helen is scared and you know that's enough for her to like to show like this immense well of empathy towards her mm -hmm. yeah it's it's really cool and uh, and again like uh you're right it's very impactful in the book i think that you know this was like a key point and, and and the reason for that is is yeah we're seeing a different side of both of them we're seeing helen become like vulnerable for the first time in the book uh you know we're like oh she's got this vulnerability to her you know that we didn't realize and and we're also seeing lilith i mean maybe equally vulnerable but in a different way um you know just two things that we didn't really expect here because it wasn't what we saw of the characters initially, um, but it fits with their personalities. You know, it fits with with what we've been told so far. It's just not something that we've seen yet. And we're like, okay, there's there's like a turn here, and there's like this relationship that's you know forming, and there's this uh, I I don't know I I don't know exactly how to explain it, but it's just yeah, it really makes you kind of care about these characters. If you were kind of half in before this point, you know, now you're like, okay, I'm invested. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well said. And it's yeah, also, um, it's a very surprising turn for Lilith, I feel, because like, you know, mm -hmm. previously, you know, from what we've seen of her, you get the sense of the kind of character she is. And like, you know, you expect her to be, you know, the very typical, almost like stereotypical sort of like, you know, again, stern governess, you know? Yep. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, everything prior kind of leads us to expect that, you know, I, I mean, she's she's not exactly, you know, the, the friendliest person. Uh, you know, I, she, yeah, I mean, honestly, like, you know, she's coming off as someone like who, like, you half expect to turn out to be racist at any moment, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I know that, you know, but here we see, okay, no, she, she genuinely cares, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. And so, yeah, just, just a very nice scene that really holds the whole story together. Yeah. And, and kind of where it goes next, uh, again, like it's almost going to sound like we're contradicting ourselves like a little bit, but, but we're not, it's just, you know, the, how, how the story plays out. Um, but, you know, uh, again, it's kind of the next day, everybody gets up and everything and, uh, you know, Helen's, I, I don't know, she passed out somewhere again or whatever, but um, we get this scene and Helen you know, is, is, is letting Lilith know, Hey, I, you know, they're talking, uh, you know, they're having a conversation or whatever. And Helen, you know, jumps into this, like, I, I need a pack of cigarettes. I need some cigarettes now. And she's like, you know, she's just, she's trying to brush it off a little bit. Like, no, like you don't need to smoke. Blah, blah, blah. You know, start, it's a filthy habit, blah, blah, blah. And then it gets a little bit more intense. Like it escalates to a certain point where you're not expecting. Um, okay. And I, I really wasn't expecting that. You know, I, I was expecting like, okay, these two have bonded. Like, you know, she, Helen's getting scared going and sleeping in, in Lilith's bed and everything. She's going to be much more sympathetic. She's going to be like, okay, this damaged girl needs a pack of cigarettes, like whatever, you know. Uh, but she's very, very stern. She's like, you know, basically, you know, calling her out for it. She's like, 
you know, that's disgusting. You don't need to smoke. You need some discipline in your life and, and all of this stuff. You sound desperate. Um, you know, she, it's like, she's almost kind of out for blood at this point. She's like, I've had enough of this. I'm, I'm not doing this. And, uh, and it's just not where I expected it to go. And I really like that. Again, it like really fleshed it out for me because uh, again, trying to relate things to real life and all of that, uh, you know, whether you're in a fantastical story or not, um, you know, it's the character elements that matter. And, and that's how nuanced people are, you know, uh, you know, you and I may, um, you know, have like a, a similar situation, you know, where, uh, you know, unfortunately I have to go get you and bring you to your grandfather's uh, giant rich estate or whatever. And you're being a jerk about it and all of that. And, you know, you're scared and you have to come get in the bed with me, whatever. But, um, you know, if it comes down to that, you know, I, I'm not going to be thinking about that anymore. You know, I'm going to be like, damn it, getting like, stop, like stop smoking, stop doing this. Like you're a kid, like, what are you doing? You know, like those kinds of things come out. And, and I like that, you know, Tom King is, is nuanced enough to recognize those kind of character traits and, and, and use it to make the story move along and use it to help us understand our relationship better. I like how very specific you got with that hypothetical. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'm just uh, calling the future as I see it, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but here again, here's the thing that, like, again, like when I'm, re when I'm seeing this scene, I like, oh, well, first of all, I, you know, I think the escalation is all because of they brought her father. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a that's still a very touchy subject for for Helen. Sure. I think that, you know, I think that's that's the main reason is suddenly like explodes. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, again, I, with this scene, like I just find myself thinking, like, you know, why are they letting her get away with all this? Like, <laughs> right? why, why, is, why are Lilith and Joseph like just letting her do all this? I mean, how hard can it be to like to keep a 16 year old like in check, you know? And I guess, I guess <laughs> what's going on is that, like, they don't have a clear understanding of, like, what they're allowed to do in terms of discipline because she's not, because, you know, the her grandfather is not there. If he was there, you know, they could, like, say, okay, let's do this to her. Let's, you know, let's keep her locked up in her room or whatever. But he's not there. So there is that sense of, like, well, what can we do? Like, well, what are we actually allowed to do? We don't know what the boundaries are. And yeah, and perfect. You know that that really makes sense. Um, I didn't even think about that that side of it. You know that they are, you know, basically an employees of you know this uh, this man, and you know who are they to jump in and you know discipline her or whatever? That's not really what he asked them to do. But you know, circling back to to what you said, you know, how hard is it to keep like a sixteen year old in check? Uh, getting, do you not remember like the catch me outside girl and everything? I mean, sometimes <laughs> uh, it, I, I'm sure it can be, um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I love where the book goes after this because it's really, really cool. And this is where it like, you know, you keep thinking you get to these little points where it turns and like, no, now it's, it's turned <laughs> now, now we're, we're somewhere else. We're in a different book now, but, um, but it really fits the story. But uh, we see this panel, and, and I want to talk about this panel for a second. I don't know if you have the book open next to you or not, but if not, hopefully you remember what I'm talking about. I have the about. digital version, yeah, on my screen. Okay, cool. Um, so the next panel, after we get out of that, you know, I, I don't know what you call that room. Maybe they're in the library or something, but they're next to, like, this fire, uh, Lilith and, and uh, Helen, and, you know, they're throwing the book and everything. And then we get over to the next page, and the first panel is Helen... Uh, walking down steps um, and there's like this, I, I don't know, illuminated thing. Um, I, I, I don't know how you would describe that, but uh, again, like, I don't know if you have that panel open or not, but um, it, it's like, Are where the, about the monster before the monster. Um, I'm talking here. I'll, I'll see if I can get it on screen for you specifically this panel right here. Uh, if that, Okay. Sorry, and I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. try to edit. This yeah, out. I see it. Yeah. So panel <laughs> yeah, yeah. two of, of the panel of the panel two of the page right before the monster. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so yeah, we've got we've got you know where the stairs all meet together, and then you know we're we're going down the stairs towards the entrance of the house and everything, and and uh, Helen is, you know, out in the woods or whatever. She she's walked out in, in front of the house. The door's wide open and. I'm sorry. I said Helen. I meant I meant Lilith. <laughs> Lilith is is at the you know 
staircase there and, and she's reached out and she's got the lantern in hand and everything. And uh, again, like I'm just trying to paint a picture here for, for people who don't have it in front of them, but uh, uh, Helen is, is out in the woods and we get this great, great panel of her, you know, we get the action shot of her running, you know, as fast as she can with like the, the you know, speed lines around her. I don't know what you call those. And, and she's screaming, Lilith, it's here. And Lilith is, you know, come out and tried to comfort her and everything. And, and Lilith is like, ah, oh, you're just having like, you know, one of your crazy nightmares, daydreams, whatever, drunken stupors, like whatever it is. And then we see, no, there's like this giant ass, like, <laughs> I don't even know how you would describe that monster. But. Yeah, like, I'm curious, like, when you look at that, that thing, um, mm -hmm. like, what, what's the first animal that comes to your mind? Like, what's the first point of comparison for you? I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Before I saw its size, I thought it was like a bat. <laughs> yes, yes, that's what I'm saying. Like, the face, right? The face, right? Yeah. Like, it definitely evokes a bat yes and we're not seeing the horns too because we see like it has like little horns coming out like devil horns um or uh, i don't know i don't I don't know what you call those but the the, the little spiky turned up horns but then once we get to <laughs> yeah once we get to the the panel underneath we're seeing like the big like oxen type of horns you know that protrude out the side of the head and go for i don't know forever right. um I, I, yeah i think those devil horns are actually it's ears it's pointy oh ears. are those ears oh, okay yeah, yeah that makes sense okay yeah that's yeah, okay but yeah, then, very yeah, that the vampire -esque. Horns. i mean yeah. sorry bat ass yeah but uh, okay yeah yeah i see it now um and and i love it whenever we get into the monster here because uh, again like it's it looks like a bat crossed with like i don't know I, is, is that an ox is that what you call those things so they have the big horn sticking out the side something like that um yeah ox or bison no, yeah that was bison something my something. first thoughts like that uh -huh. ox or bison <laughs> yeah it's just a weird hybrid animal but but then you get to its hands and that's a very important part of of that next panel there is, is the hands of it uh it's got these like disgustingly long nails like they look like they're like longer than the horns on its head they're so long and this monster is huge once we see it in comparison to Lilith and Helen. And uh, Lilith, you know, has that lantern and she, uh, you know, brings it up and and it seems like, you know, they're like cooked, like they're done because the monster is like, you know, landing on them, just about to attack and everything. And then, nope, all of a sudden it retreats and like runs in the opposite direction. And you're like, what the hell could be happening here? <laughs> and uh, from there, you know, we're, this is basically, you know, we're, we're close to the end of the story, but all of a sudden this sword comes out of nowhere and the monsters had, the monsters just like decapitated. And you're like, what the hell? <laughs> who did this? Um, and then we see Barnabas Cole, who is the uh, grandfather, uh, Helen's grandfather. And he's like, walking around with this giant bloody sword and this gigantic monster head that's like i don't know it's bigger than barnabas's entire being there mm -hmm. um and he's just carrying around its head and it's pretty freaking crazy and that again that's another really really cool like one page spread that looks mm -hmm. amazing i'd love to see i you know what, what i would really love to see in this i would love to see the uncolored like line work for this like i think that that would look amazing yeah um, yeah definitely i love the uh the demon or monster or whatever i love its facial expression in this <laughs> it, it's dead but like uh -huh. it looks it looks so aggrieved like oh god why me <laughs> <laughs> can you believe this guy you know? that i mean, like that looks like he's thinking can you believe this guy you know? <laughs> yeah it does it has that very defeated look i mean one eye is like just turned up you know like it's rolling its eyes in the back of its head and the other eye is just you know it looks like the monsters had a stroke and uh yeah it's 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 pretty good um the the visual storytelling right here in this panel is is really awesome really amazing and the introduction of barnabas cole too uh really cool like he's this chiseled like old man, you know, he's got his full gray beard and his gray head of hair, you know, kind of longer hair and his cloak and all of that. And uh, of course he's got his bloodied up sword. He's got another sword, you know, attached to his belt or something there. Just... <laughs> cool looking I, guy. I didn't even notice that. Yeah, wow. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, he does. He does have two swords or maybe one sword and one dagger thingy. I don't know. Yeah, something oh, yeah, like he's... that. 
he's like, you know, Barnabas seems to be like one of those like old men that only like seems to exist in fiction where like, you know, <laughs> they have old men who have like the bodies of like 25 year olds, you know? Right. Yeah. I'm like, hey, I never even got a body like that. How does this dude have it? Uh, <laughs> he's like 80, but hey, good for him. Uh, he, I mean, obviously he's out there doing the work. So, you know, uh, I guess it pays off, but uh, it's, it's, you know, you would think that that would be the end there. That would be the to be continued, but we get one more page, you know, we get, uh, what is this? Uh, six more panels. Um, and, you know, like, like we said at the beginning, um, Lilith is kind of being interviewed by somebody and that person is talking to her and she's kind of narrating the story. Uh, I, I guess the person's name is Thomas. I, I didn't catch that before, but, and Lilith is explaining, you know, because Thomas is acting or, or sorry, asking like, Oh, that's, that's pretty crazy. Like, was this part of a nightmare? Was this like a fantasy? Was, and she's like, no, this, this actually happened. This was what happened at Windhorn. And he's like, huh? <laughs> what? what? I thought we were, yeah, I thought you were going to recount, you know, like the, the story or whatever, not, not all this fantastical like stuff or whatever. And uh, pretty crazy. Um, uh, Lilith then pulls out a pack of cigarettes and <laughs> lights up a cigarette. And she's like, no, that was Windhorn, and this is just the beginning. <laughs> and man, right. And not to state the obvious, but like mm -hmm. you know, her her smoking is tells us a lot without yeah. saying anything because because she was so adamantly against the habit, you know, mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in the flashback scenes. So she's been through a lot. Is yeah, <laughs> is our takeaway. <laughs> Yeah, she's picked up some habits from Helen, um, you know, and and yeah, uh, I, I would assume she's pretty stressed at this point, uh, you know, dealing with what she's dealt with. And now, now knowing she's not, you know, just getting this girl back home, like she's, you know, kind of got to protect this girl. She's, she's really got to be that like motherly figure now or whatever. Um, there's a lot, you know, to unpack here and a lot that I'm sure, you know, is going to go on. But Man, just the setup of this story, this being a first issue and all this contained in one issue is like just kind of blowing my mind, um, to be honest with you, that they were able to get all of this in a single issue. I was really scared when I first read this book because I've read it three times. And the first time I read it and we got about to the midway point, I was like, I don't know, it's, it's hitting a lull and I'm not too sure like where they plan on going from here. Like I, I'm at the point where I could start to get a little checked out and be a little bored. And then, you know, it, it picked right back up. So it, it didn't have that problem at all. But I mean, in all honesty, with the scope of what's going on here, you really do need a second to breathe before you take all this in. Uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's a lot. Um, but yeah, this was, this was fantastic. Uh, this was such a cool read. Um, Tell me what you thought about it. Yeah, no, no, it's, I agree. It's a, it's a great first issue. It, it, you know, it sets up the premise very well. We get a good, strong sense of our leads, our main characters, mm -hmm. and it ends on such a tantalizing note. We're just, we're right. just wondering, what is going to happen next? <laughs> well, what is even going on? You know, not just what mm -hmm. happens next, but like, what the hell is even happening here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's done in such a way where, you know, again, Tom King's really good at this, uh, you know, circling back to like, uh, you know, uh, Moment of Tomorrow or, or Animal Pound or something. Uh, Tom King is really, he's actually really good at, at structure and he's really good at, you know, ending an issue at a certain point, you know, and, and where we're going to pick back up on the next issue and stuff like that. I remember thinking when I read uh, Animal Pound, like, it, it was almost like that story was self-contained, but it obviously had like a lot more places to go. But like, I'm like, okay, well, these animals are like wising up and they're, you know, they're overthrowing, you know, their human captors or maybe captors isn't the right word, but uh, you know, whatever. And um, they're, you know, they're figuring out the society and what they're going to do next and everything, but they're like free, you know, that's how that issue ended, you know, spoiler alert for animal pound, but, uh, the issue ended with like, okay, well, all the humans are gone and now we're here, we're in charge. So like, well, what are we going to do next? You know, and it ended right there. And, and this kind of does the same thing. It's like, it's very contained. You could read this first issue and be very satisfied. I mean, of course, of course, you're going to want to know what happens next. Um, you know, it's a page turner. Like you absolutely like 
I don't want to wait till what April 17th or whatever it is uh, to figure out what happens next. But um, I'm very satisfied with the story. And it's something that I could easily go back and read again and again, um, you know, just on the single issue alone. Uh, really, really cool, really good setup for this world. And, and such, uh, I don't know, there's such big things happening in it. Yeah, it, you know, it feels like it doesn't feel like the story's just barely started. Well, I know it does. It does. But <laughs> I mean, it, but only in the sense that this, this sounds like it's going to be like quite a long story. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel like you've just only stepped into this world and now you're already stepping out, you know, like, like, like some first issues, do. some issue, first issues, is like, you know, you just breeze through them. And like, by the time you get to the end, you're like, you know, that was interesting, but like, you know, that's it. Like, you know, I, I, I could have just probably just skipped right to number two. <laughs> <For> two. <laughs> and, and it's right because I, I think, you know, what you're, you're saying, or at least my experience with, with what you're saying is, now I can find like a lot of good in a lot of things. There's not, um, you know, there's different ways to tell stories. There's different storytellers, all of that stuff. Uh, artists and, and writers work together very differently, whatever. There's a lot of caveats going on in a comic book. We know that. Um, the important thing that I, that I would like to say about that is some things, unfortunately do really read better in trade. Uh, they read better because you get that full story um, and, and they're not, great at you know uh, tying up a single issue but also leaving it on this huge cliffhanger to where you just have to one you know know what's going to happen next and all of that it's just you know some people don't write like that um i think of something like saga or why the last man and those are very similar to this for me because i can read a single issue of either of those books and i am like very very satisfied uh but at the same time, when I have the full trade or omnibus or something in front of me, I'm like really happy. You know, I'm like, I get to just keep going. This is amazing. Um, and, and not everybody has that. You know, sometimes you you read a story and, and like you said, you're like, OK, well, I could have, you know, used a little bit more information here. Um, I can't believe you're going to leave it on this and you expect me to be jazzed about remembering this book and then, you know, remembering to pick up a copy of issue number two next month and all of that, or, or in some cases even longer. Uh, but Tom King really, and, and I don't want to um, downplay, you know, the importance of anybody else on this book, but I'm just going to say Tom King because I'm specifically talking about the scripting and writing. Uh, you know, he just really is really, really good at, uh, you know, making like this self-contained story in a single issue in this huge, like, vast bigger world um i don't know i just i think that it's it's something like not a lot of people can do yeah um, well with king i think like one, one of the things he does well is like he can pack a lot of scenes into mm -hmm. into a 20 page comic or however however i'm not sure how exactly how long this <laughs> is but yeah I don't, this one seems a little oversized to tell you yeah. the truth but yeah but he can uh, pack a lot in is what i'm saying because he he often goes for like you know, scenes that are very short, so like mm -hmm. one page scenes, two page scenes, and like he just has like a whole bunch of them. So by the time you get to the end of the issue, it feels like wow, a lot has happened. You know, yes, in a way that it, it wouldn't feel if it was like you know just four or five page scenes. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and and that definitely makes sense. Um, well, before we get out of it, uh, let's talk about the art for just a second, because we've talked so much about Tom King and it would be a huge disservice to not mention any of the other people that worked on this book. Again, if, if you want to hop in with <laughs> pronunciations, feel free, but I'll, I'll try, uh, Bill Quist, uh, Edley, Edley, um, this is on. something we definitely should have looked up before. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I'm horrible. For, look, I, I could... I could, you know, do my research all day long on pronouncing someone's name. And then the second that it comes down to it, I'm not even close. So uh, I just, I stumble and I'm okay with that. But um, no, yeah, I'm, I'm just saying like, we, we are almost certainly getting it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but no, her art is, is wonderful. You know, it's, I mean, what else, what more is there to say about it? Like, you know, anyone who's seen Supergirl, Women of Tomorrow, you know, mm -hmm. they, 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 they know what we're talking about. This is, there is this sort of like, I don't know. I mean, this, this, and maybe I'm talking on my ass here, but like, there's a slight, like this slightly European flair to, to uh -huh. her sensibility, you know? No, I'm, I'm with you on that because I also feel the, the same thing. Um, now it's, 
it does have like a, a flair of that. And also you would think maybe just picking up this book and not having uh, Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow to, to back it up and everything. Like maybe it's just kind of like a period piece or whatever. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's definitely a style um, and it's, it's done really, really well. But yeah, uh, there's, there's like this sketchiness, this grittiness to it. Um, this, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what exactly how to describe it, but uh, you know, words escape me, but um there's there's something to it there's a very like lived in feel it's not like the cleanest lines ever or anything but it's very outstanding art and uh you know just to be able to see i'm not sure this is supposed to be modern day i, I would assume you know somewhere close to modern day or something like that in the the opening scenes and then we you know flash back to the 30s or whatever or 40s and then uh we also have like the pulp novel aspects of it so there's there's a pretty good range of things going on with the art here. It's, it's really cool. Especially I would like to just showcase to you that very first full page spread, that first page when you open it up and it shows, um, uh, you know, uh, who, who I'm guessing is supposed to be uh, CK and, and, and Helen, you know, stylized in some kind of weird way or whatever, but, uh, or maybe just the pulp characters of, of Othin or whatever his name is. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that page is so different from the rest of the book and it's really, really cool. And you get like little glimpses of it here and there whenever they show uh, little pieces of, of, you know, covers of that book or whatever. Well, and I think a lot of that, you know, also comes down to, to whatever the colorist is doing, to yes. whatever uh, Matthias Lopez is doing, I guess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, he, yeah, he makes it, he gives it this effect that makes it look like we're, that makes it look like we're looking at like the cover of like some paperback or something, some, you know, some old timey pulp paperback. Yes. Uh, yeah. That stuff is done really, really well. And the palette that he's using on that, you know, it's got these like muted tones and everything that work really, really well and seem pretty time accurate to stuff I've seen from, from that period and everything. Uh, really, really, I, I don't know, just done so nice. Like I really like it a lot. Stuff. And one thing Bill Chris does really well, or Bill Quis, or yeah, I'm sure we're pronouncing like <laughs> yeah. a dozen different ways, but look, by look, the end, by, by the end of this one, we don't every single it. possible way. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but sorry if anyone who's French is, is, is it, is, I don't even know, is it French? Uh, sorry, whatever, you know, whatever right. language. Like, we're not even going to come close, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Anyone who, who speaks that language natively, sorry that we're, we're totally... <laughs> I, look, but, everybody um, who listens to this podcast is very used to the butchering of names, so no apologies <laughs> necessary. Uh, but I was, what I was going to say is um, one thing that she does very well is, like, the intense stare, you know, a mm -hmm. character gives, oh, like... Oh, yeah. Stare, yeah. It's, there's just, like, so much there. Like, you know, the, the eyes are just boring into into your like the soul of your being you know yeah and and very intentional and yeah it's almost like uh, even even just the cover of this book i don't know what cover you have uh handy but um i grabbed this which i think is the regular you know the a cover it's just like a foil trade dress but uh you know helen's just staring into your soul <laughs> right there with the windhorn estate behind her and it's yeah it's it, yeah i'm with you on that it's crazy uh really really cool really intentional and it, it's almost like you know those uncomfortable moments where you're watching like a, a documentary or something and then the person's just kind of staring into your soul for a second you're like i don't know man i want to look away i know it's on tv but <laughs> i feel a little weird i feel too vulnerable <laughs> that's the perfect way of describing it. yeah yeah um this this is this is really cool you know and and again like i we don't want to take too much more time on it we're about at the hour mark now and um you know, I'll, I'll start wrapping up my end of it, but you know, all in all, I'm, I'm really happy you suggested this book. I'm really happy that we got a chance to do it and talk about it. Um, I, I think this is a, you know, I, I can't say this about all comics, you know, every now and again, a comic comes out and it's something like very, very special. And like I talked about at the beginning with something like Ghost Rider, Final Vengeance and everything. I had such a great time reading that book. It was, it was so fun and I'll remember it, you know, forever. I'll remember scenes of that. And, and things that it was trying to do and everything and it was impactful and I liked it but every now and again a book like this comes along and it's just the perfect storm of everything and again like I'm kind of gonna 
relate it to something like, uh, you know, stuff that Brian K. Vaughn does, stuff that, uh, you know, Bendis has done, um, stuff that, uh, I don't know, Peter Milligan has done, you know, that was just very impactful to me, um, you know, like like a soccer or Why the Last Man, Right of Baghdad, you know, stuff like that, uh, the X-Force run. Um, it, it It's really, really good. This first issue does a lot, and I... I hope it doesn't fall off at all, but I'm not really scared that it does. I think that this is like planned out very, very well. And I think that it's only going to like expand it for me. And I'm really excited to read issue number two. I think this was amazing. Yeah. One thing that surprised me was that like looking into this book, apparently it's actually just an eight issue limited series, or maybe it wasn't eight, but it was, I forget the exact number, but apparently it's just, you know, it's just something along those lines. Yeah. Mm. I, was, I thought it was going to be like, a proper ongoing ongoing you know and i don't know maybe it's planned to be like a series of mini series i don't know but um but in any case i i, I have no i i you know i am not worried that's going to fall off a cliff because uh well, tom king you know he's he's earned my trust by this point <laughs> i mean i don't love everything he writes but mm -hmm. you know i usually you know i i know by the end of the first issue like whether i am going to like it or not you know it, it doesn't suddenly like sure. shift from like from being great to to being not so great you know um mm -hmm. and you know this this was such a solid like solid um launch you know so i i i'm sure the i'm sure it's gonna be solid all the way through yeah completely agreed i'm i'm excited to see where this goes and uh uh, just you know to say one more thing about that you know before we wrap up here i i guess you know i hadn't really thought about it uh, not being like a actual ongoing um i think you know in the back of my head it's a dark horse book and it seems like they don't really go past like issue number four on anything <laughs> um uh, you know even even something as you know much of a staple as like hellboy or something like that for them it's almost like they just dip in and out of these little stories and give it a subtitle and you know it's it's like a four issue like limited run or whatever on that but um yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of uh, really cool stuff to unpack here. And, you know, I, again, like I'll, I'll read this again. This is this is really good. Highly recommended. Uh, with that being said, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. We already we already passed the hour mark here. But um, thank you so much for suggesting this book. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, please feel free to suggest another anytime, especially if it's going to be anything like this. So. No, my pleasure. I mean, no, it was, I, I, I was, no, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk about this delightful book. Before we go though, one question, like, of course, where do you think this is heading? Like by the end of the first issue, you know, we've read the first issue. Where do you think this is going? <laughs> I, uh, I, it's so hard to put any expectation on it. Um, I feel like whatever I say, it's going to take the hugest left turn. Uh, I feel like in all honesty, I'm I'm going to go ahead and say this. I feel like we're not going to address hardly anything that happened here on in the next issue, and I feel like <laughs> we're going to develop more of Lilith and Helen's like relationship, and you know maybe bring the grandfather in like a little bit. You know maybe there'd be like a few panels of that or something, and then it'll go away on a mission or something again. But I I just I don't see them like diving head first into the fantastical part of it in the next issue. Um, I absolutely could be completely wrong but i don't know that's that's what that's my prediction i i hadn't considered that <laughs> uh, but i think you know i think you know you, you might be right on the money because that that definitely feels like something king would do you know <laughs> i think one of his trademarks is like you know, he'll like he'll end on like a really dramatic scene but mm -hmm. then like the next issue he just like he skipped past like the immediate aftermath you know? yeah 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 yeah, and uh, again, if, if that's what happens, you know, I, I trust Tom King. He's he's a good storyteller. So, uh, whatever happens, I'm along. I don't know the ride for it. <laughs> it yeah, this yeah. was really cool. I'm 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 really really happy I read this. Uh, yeah, man, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me about it today. Uh, much appreciated. I had a great time, man. Yeah, great time. You, you know what we should do. Uh, you know, whatever that is, April, April 17th, whatever, mid-April, um, you know, whenever issue number two comes out, you know, we don't normally do this on this podcast, but yeah, April 17th, we should, we should uh, touch on issue number two. <laughs> no, I think that would be that fun. Would, that would be amazing. Yeah. I would do, love a, to. do a follow-up episode. Yeah. I, I'd love to. I'd love to talk and about this a little more. We can see how, 
how dreadfully wrong all our predictions <laughs> Yeah, exactly right. Uh, like, no, it just goes into the pulp. That's all it is. It's just the pulp novel, like, for, for three issues. And then we step back out to uh, Helen. But, <laughs> yeah, e either way, I'm along for the ride. Um, cool. Well, getting, I, again, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to talk to me about Helen of Windhorn today. And thank you so much. And have a good night. You too, man. Good night. <laughs>